planet, the evolution of the planet that ultimately drives all of these things is going to rely on paleomagnetic observations. And so the goal of this work really was to try to figure out or develop physical models that we could use to quantitatively interpret paleomagnetic observations with really the goal of squeezing all of the information out of them that we possibly can. Because again, I really believe this is, this is the future. Now in, in principle, um, numerical dynamo models should be able to serve that, that task. Um, the problem is that when you're using numerical dynamo models to do especially a paleomagnetic things, sort of things that you need to integrate over geological time, you generally make the models a little bit coarser, you use absurdly large viscosities, I mean they're absurdly large under any circumstances, but even worse than normal. And to be honest, I'm not sure how much insights that we can take from those things. So the goal here was to think about other ways of doing it. Um, and the approach that I'm going to describe is the use of, of stochastic models. Um, a comment that came up earlier was something about statistics being physics-free, and I'm going, to, I'm going to dispute that point. I don't think that has to be true. Um, but the, the point here is I think that stochastic models are actually ideally suited for this problem. And I'm going to sort of show you uh, one example and then maybe one example. And if I have a little time at the end, I'd like to uh, save it and, and turn to the question of supercrons. Let's see if we can, we can get there. Okay. So the origin of stochastic models really begins with the problem of Brownian motion. So the uh, ob observation that uh, particles in water would be sort of moving around in a, in a, a, a volume of, of water. And so what was observed, of course, is this particle moving and there was no obvious uh, source of energy. But what we obviously recognize now is that this thing, this particle is moving as a, res as a result of water molecules impacting on it. So there's a couple of things that go into the uh, modeling, uh, model considerations. One is the issue of macroscopic things versus microscopic things. So we can see this but we can't see the water molecules, and so there's no chance of ever being able to sort of map out their exact positions. And then the second point is that there are sort of slow versus fast motions. So macroscopic things tend to be slow, and the microscopic things that we can't see tend to be fast. And so just applying Newton's uh, second law to this problem, we've got the acceleration of the particle that we're interested in, it's moving through the fluid, so we might imagine that there's some viscous uh, effects. And this would be part of the deterministic forces that you might want to consider. And then there are a bunch of these uh, impulsive uh, collision forces, which are ultimately going to contribute uh, to the motion. And the point is that the idea with Brownian motion and developing these stochastic models was to treat this function in some random way, some random process. That's the idea. Okay, so let's make the connection then to the uh, paleomagnetic field. So, uh, and specifically the amplitude of the dipole, so dipole moment. Uh, we could think of the dipole moment as a function of time being given by uh, one of source term. So this is the uh, generation of the dipole field through helical convection in the core. And this is a nice picture from one of Peter Olson's early studies showing that process in our current dynamic models. And what I'm going to do, and also we can have decay, right? So the dipole, if you don't generate it, will decay by moment decay uh, on a time scale which is set by the dipole decay time. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to let this source term be decomposed into two parts. There'll be one which is sort of the average rate at which the field is being generated, and then the fluctuation about that average. And so if I take these two pieces and I just reorganize them into this form, I've got this one piece which is slowly evolving, either a constant piece or a slowly decaying part, and that's, the, um, that's going to be the slowly varying deterministic piece. And then I'm going to let this fluctuation about the average be like the, the molecules hitting the pollen molecule, and I'm going to treat that as a, a random process. That's the idea. So this has exactly the form that we need to um, uh, apply the sort of standard techniques, the sort of Langevin models, uh, stochastic differential equations. So again, we're thinking about the evolution of the dipole field. Uh, in the classical sense of these models, you've got some deterministic uh, component here, which is often referred to in the literature as drift. Uh, and then we have a noise term or a random term here, the this D, which is often referred to as the diffusion coefficient, sets the amplitude of the noise. And then the actual details of the noise here, this function uh, gamma, uh, has the property that has a zero average and it has an autocorrelation function, the product of these two average as a delta function. So you don't get anything in terms of this average unless you're at exactly the same time. So this is uh, essentially mean zero, 
white noise with a variance of two, which is just uh, for convenience in representing this. Okay, so here's just uh, an example realization of, of the problem. Uh, we have this differential equation. Let's say we know these terms. I haven't told you where these come from yet, but we, we say we know these terms. Uh, we start with the initial condition of eight, so my dipole moment here is eight, and then I run a bunch of realizations, and these would be the paths that we tend to follow. Each one's a little bit different, and so we're never going to be really very interested in all the wiggles and details. We don't care. But what we might want to do is something related, sort of statistical description of this. We might want to know, for example, after 20,000 years, what's the mean? Or maybe what's the variance? Or maybe even what's the probability distribution of states at this particular point? Or even going further, what would be the probability distribution of this thing at any time, any subsequent? We could do this in a variety of ways. We could do this by just running lots of uh, realizations and just collecting statistics on that, and that's a perfectly reasonable way to go. But it turns out that a couple of very bright characters, uh, Max Planck among them, and Adrian Folk, uh, figured out a way of describing the evolution of the probability distribution as this variable, the dipole moment as a function of time, and it's given by now this equation called the Folk and Planck equation. So, the thing is that the only things that go into this are the drift term, the deterministic piece, and the, the amplitude of the noise term. And we can solve this, say, if we know the initial state, then the probability distribution is like a delta function, we know its position absolutely. And then it, this will evolve according to this equation as a function of time. We can use this in a very powerful way. Um, this is sort of an example of what you might get. You might start with the delta function, and it spreads out, that has some finite variance with time, uh, the mean can potentially drift with time, and also the variance can uh, continually spread out further and further and further. And so this drift term uh, essentially governs where the mean of this probability distribution is going to be. And essentially the diffusion term, uh, the noise term, essentially controls the variance of the distribution. Okay. What's really important here is that we can actually recover these terms from a realization of the process. So the drift term, to calculate the drift term, we just simply take the dipole moment at some particular time and we uh, difference it from the dipole moment at some subsequent time where delta t is yet to be prescribed. And then we divide that by delta t and, and then take the limit as delta t goes to zero. Um, you know, in principle, we can't do this with data sets because we can never take the limit, but what we would like is delta t to be small enough that this quantity doesn't change. And we can sort of test that, essentially. Uh, the other thing to notice is that this drift function depends on x. So in other words, it depends on the value that I start. And so from a practical way, what you do is you take the dipole moments and you divide them into bins, and then you do this average in different bins. That will come up. Um, the diffusion term is kind of similar. You take the difference between x now and x sometime in the future, uh, and then you square it, and then you take the average of that. It's also a function of x, so we would also divide this up in, into bins and, and do those averages. So we can apply this, and we have um, to the, so I guess it's pad m 2 m. Is that right? That's the correct pronunciation of this model. I've been saying p to m for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, but we can basically take this model from Ziegler et al. from 2011. <clears throat> That's the lemon bar actually coming back on me. Um, so here's the, the VADM uh, function of time. Here's the present. Here's two million years ago. And this is sort of what we think uh, the amp amplitude of the dipole moment has been doing over the last two million years. And so here's the drift term again. Here's the, uh, the diffusion term or the, yeah, the diffusion term. And we have a number of practical uh, considerations that we need to think about in terms of value. So one is, uh, what should we use for the delta t's? Um, in some sense, we'd like to make the delta t's as small as possible, but there can be a problem that if we actually make the delta t too small, um, when I assume that that noise term was uncorrelated, it's possible that I can make the time sufficiently small that the assumption that the noise is uncorrelated might not be right. And so I want to be on the lookout for that. But I also don't want to let it become too large either. And so I also need to think about how we define bins. So let me just show you uh, one example uh, for the drift term. And so what I'm showing you here is an estimate of the recover for the drift, essentially evaluating this as a function of different choices for delta t. And each of these lines represents the average uh, taken in a different bin for a different x. 
And the values that you see there are just the amplitude of the dipole moment at the center of the bin in which these averages are made. So in other words, this average is made uh, with dipole moments around three. This one is made with averages around seven, 7.8, okay? And what you'll notice is that at low delta t's, these values are all much smaller than they are at slightly larger uh, delta t's. And so I think what we're looking at here is the influence of the correlation in the noise. This could be a bunch of different things. This could be, for example, the acquisition of the magnetization in the sediments, for example. It could be contributing to this. But at some point, you actually get to a value, let's say, four or 5,000 years, where these things stop changing. And so the idea is we're now long enough that the assumption of an uncorrelated noise is reasonable, but these things are still small enough that they're roughly constant. If I make these take it to 10 or 12 or 40 or whatever, then these curves start to go up because some of the second order terms start to come into play. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna pull the values at 4,000 years uh, as estimates of these parameters. We can do exactly the same thing for the uh, diffusion term. Uh, this is always positive because of course this is squared. You see the different values here. You can sort of see these again rising up after around 4,000 years or so, they all become flat. And then a little bit larger, these start to pick up some second order things. So we're gonna pull these off around about 4,000 years. So here's a summary of, uh, of what you get. I'm showing you the, the uh, drift term. And so the values that have come from those binnings, these are these individual points that are represented here. So this is the drift term, this is the deterministic piece, and this is the amplitude of the noise term. Um, and what I've also done is fit a smooth spline through these. Um, and so it's clear that, you know, that's fitting the data fairly well, but the problem is that if you don't have samples of the dipole moment at low values, then you don't have enough estimates to get a good average. So you really don't know uh, what's going on in here. But we know on physical grounds that the drift term should be an odd function of the dipole moment. So we know it has to go through X. So that's, that's a useful point to know, but I don't really know how it goes from here essentially over to there. And with the noise term, we know that that's on physical grounds, that that's gonna be an even function. And so we know that the derivative here has to be zero, but we don't know where it was in amplitude. So this is just one possibility, potentially, that then fits uh, the, drift and the, uh, the drift term and the uh, noise term um, at the values where we can construct it. Okay, so if we look at this, uh, the average dipole moment is about 5.3, and that's essentially where, at least from my perspective, that's what's right. Uh, but anyways, zero uh, corresponds to about 5.3, and the point is that's where the drift term vanishes. If we were at high dipole moments, uh, then the drift term is negative, and that says move the dipole moment back to lower values. If the uh, Drift term is positive at lower values. That says move the dipole moment back, deterministically back to higher values. And then this is saying how large are the amplitudes of the fluctuations. And they're sort of roughly constant here. And as we go to low dipole moments, it looks like the amplitude of the fluctuations is actually increasing. So all of this is just simply coming from the observations, from the data. So Kathy, apologies. I understand it's a model, but from my perspective, this is kind of like data, the PADM is kind of data. Okay, sorry. Um, what you can do, which is kind of interesting, is you can, you can represent the drift term as the gradient of a potential. It's just another way of representing the same information. But what's interesting is if I now integrate uh, the, uh, drift term, the drift term here to reconstruct what this potential actually looks like, this is what you get. It's this sort of potential well with two different states. And so you can kind of imagine what's, what's going to happen here, right? The dipole is going to be rattling around in here, jiggled by this noise term. Maybe every once in a while, it's able to hop over into the other band and it will rattle around in here for a little bit. Uh, so in some sense, this model should be able to predict reversals, and it does. But the remarkable thing to me is that this potential well essentially has been constructed from observations and some assumptions about the symmetries of these functions. It's pretty remarkable to me. Um, you can also use this model then to make predictions for reversals. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can do it. You can just simply run simulations and ask the question, how often uh, does it take for the state here to hop over and go into this state? You can use the Folke Planck equation to do the same thing. And for this setup, it's about one, one reversal per one million years. So it's not quite consistent with the geological observations, but the point is it makes predictions for that quantity, which is good. 
And again, I want to stress that the only information that has gone into this are differences in the dipole moment separated by 4,000 years. So there's no information about reversals that go into this, and yet this model is, is going to be able to predict uh, reversal rates, for example. So the one application that I wanted to consider is the question of the duration of dipole transitions. And so this is probably a, a very a familiar figure. Uh, it's actually taken from one of Brad's papers. Uh, actually, when I found this on the web, it had very different labels here. So they had corrupted this, and I think it said after your paper. So this is, this is corrected with the original labels. What you can see is the VGP latitude. You've got uh, deep down in the sediment core, you've got um, one particular polarity, then there's this transition period, and you go to another. And the normal argument is that the transition period is something on the order of 7,000 years, maybe some dependence on latitude. But the point is that this is a transition duration which is based on directions. And so you could imagine that you know, once the polarity reverses and the dipole starts to get somewhat large, uh, the direction of that uh, VGP pole is not going to change very much. And so it could well be that the direction is reversed, but the amplitude of the field is still not recovered to its original value, for example. Okay? So what I wanted to do was ask the question, well, can we define the duration of a polarity transition based on intensity? And so the issue here is you have to define what you mean by uh, recovered. You know, we could take uh, it's recovered to 75% of its original or time average value or 100% or maybe 50%. But the idea here is to look at all of those different possibilities, to look at the recovery time as a function of different choices for the threshold. And so this is going to be, I'm going to show you a calculation and I'm going to compare it with the results that come from the, the PADM model. So the way you do this is you would put a realization here right at the origin, zero. And then you would ask the question, how long does it take before that realization moves either this way past this threshold on this side or moves this way past the threshold on that side? It doesn't really matter. It's symmetric. And the time for either one would be the same. And so the way that I've actually done this is I've used the, the Fulker-Planck equation to do it, and I get this very nice smooth prediction, which comes from that particular technique. Uh, and what you can see is that the uh, duration of the re uh, reversal depends on what we adopt as a threshold in terms of the intensity of the dipole moment, but it's clearly nonlinear, right? I mean, it's, it's going up uh, almost quadratically uh, with the intensity of the threshold. And in fact, you can actually get a, a small amplitude solution uh, that's valid sort of in this region where it's, it's clear that the duration depends on the threshold that you choose squared. This is exactly the kind of relationship that you'd expect with a diffusive process, okay? We'll come back to that in a second. So there is the prediction. It has this sort of nice curvature to it. You can also recover this information from the PADM model because we know when the re reversals happen. So we can go to PADM, we can sort of look at where the reversal happens and then ask, how long does it take before that model rises up above the threshold that we've selected? And of course, different reversals will have different durations, uh, but you can average those reversals in the PADM model, uh, take the mean, which is shown here, and then the error bars are the, uh, the variance of standard deviation of those means, and so it doesn't agree very well. But on the other hand, there's an interesting correspondence and structure. I, it's, it's sort of interesting. I guess how you look at this curve sort of says what, what something about your disposition, I think. You know, when I looked at this, I said, wow, that's pretty good, right? Because I had no idea what this was going to look like. It's interesting when I sent it to the reviewers, they had a very different response. <laughs> <laughs> this looks crappy, right? Um, just no explaining, right? So, but the, the point, I guess, is that there's some interesting structure here which seems to be uh, recovered in the model. So that was kind of interesting. But the point here, and this is the thing I want you to focus on, is that this uh, duration depends on the value of the noise term at zero, zero dipole moment, which we don't have any constraints on. And so if I were to make this a little bit bigger, my times might become a little bit lower, and I might be able to move this curve down onto that. So let's try that. So here's another, uh, another variation. So there's all those points that I had for the, the noise term. Here's the drift term again. And all I've done is I've said, let my spline go through those points as before, but now I will have it fit a derivative of zero at a much higher value, okay? And again, I, I don't have information here, so I'm, this seems as good as this one, to be honest. Uh, and what you see, what happens is that you can move this curve 
the modified numerical solution now modifies, uh, goes down to this, and it touches the tops of these, these are one sigma error bars. So I guess three out of four is about what you'd expect, right? Um, <laughs> digression, just for a sec. My thesis supervisor, he would go to AGU meetings, he was an astronomer, and he would look at data like this and he said, there's something wrong because the curve goes through all the points, and there should be at least some that are not going through the points, right? So I would say this was good. And so the reviewers were happy to kind of publish it. Okay, um, so a couple of things. Uh, one is that by increasing the, the noise term here, you actually make reversals happen a little bit more easily. You, know, you get a couple of uh, random perturbations and you hop part way up, and now you start taking bigger jumps and it's easier to get up and over. So now the mean reversal time goes down to about uh, 800,000 years. So it's a little bit better, but still not perfectly Earth-like. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this curve, uh, this new result, I guess, is that the noise term is very, very large compared with the drift curve. So if you think about the contribution of the drift and the noise and the evolution of the dipole field at low values, uh, the evolution is going to be totally dominated um, by the noise term. And so from a practical point of view, if you want to think about what that system would be like, it would be kind of like a random walk. So what that implies is that when you get to the uh, transition point of zero and you're executing uh, a random walk, I could go this way, I could come back this way a little bit, I could go back and forth. I could rattle around in here for a little bit before I actually settle into one polarity or the other one. Okay? So one of the predictions of this model is that um, reversals could potentially be very, very, in detail, could be very, very complex. This was another point that the reviewers took issue with. They said, well, we've known this since, for example, Rob Coe's paper, that reversals are complex. But what's different here is that it makes quantitative predictions about exactly what kind of complexity should we be looking for. So here's uh, a realization of the, of the model, a couple of models. They're uh, timed so that they uh, correspond with uh, the zero crossing, the first zero crossing, at time is equal to zero. So these two transitions. The one in black actually just passes through the transition and then establishes another dipole uh, polarity. So it has uh, one change of polarity through that transition. But what you can see is the second one actually uh, changes sign several times. It rattles around a little bit before it then goes back out. And so you can run a number of uh, realizations. You can construct the statistics of this, and this is what you get. Uh, roughly half the time, you would just have these simple polarity transitions where you go from one to the other and you're done. But then the other half of the time, you're going to get these multiple uh, fluctuations. And so, in principle, this is a data set. If you had sufficient resolution in the transition field, this would be something that you could uh, detect and actually test. And so the thing that I like about the stochastic models, I would say, is that you can make predictions and then you can confront those predictions with observations, maybe a wide variety of different observations, and actually incorporate wide ranges of information into the models to actually try to make sense of these different things. And again, with the goal of trying to squeeze out as much information as we possibly can. So how am I doing for time, by the way? Um, well, I'm going to show you conclusions, but three minutes, okay. <laughs> So I have slides on supercrons, if anyone wants to ask me a question on that. And I'll finish with my conclusions. How would that be? Um, stochastic models, I think, are nice. They give predictive descriptions, and that's the key point. They give predictive descriptions. And the other point is that these models are essentially constructed from the observations with a few constraints on symmetries and geometries. Okay. So the predictions can be compared with a wide variety of other observations. We can start thinking about comparing them with reversal rates. You know, if you can make or decide on how you want to define an excursion in terms of the dipole uh, moment amplitude, let's say excursions happen potentially when the dipole moment is roughly half the time average value, you can make a prediction of how often that will happen. And the answer is, with this model, it happens eight times per million years. The point is, you can then use these observations again to, to interrogate the model, test the model, and see if it works. Um, the large noise term at low field uh, implies that there's large convective fluctuations. I haven't spent any time telling you how to connect these quantities to physical quantities of interest, but it can be done. And then specifically, the noise term is related to the RMS fluctuations in the source in this sort of way. This is the correlation time of the noise. So, you know, if I've got large fluctuations, I'm getting large fluctuations in the dipole generation. And, you know, what does that mean exactly? 
And the other last point that I'll make is that these noise-driven evolutions at low X, by virtue of the large noise term, means that reversals are inherently going to be complex. But the key thing here is this model makes very specific predictions about what the time average complexity would actually look like. That maybe I'll stop. Thanks. Right. Great question, Rob. Thank you very much. Okay, so could this, could this happen by chance? And I would say no chance, right? So if we took the two million years that we have for the record and we say this is how the field is behaving and it should be governed by this stochastic model, what you can do is you can produce this reversal time distribution. What it's saying is the chances of, of reversal between t and t plus delta t is essentially this function, like a probability density function, times delta t. Okay? And so this is what comes out of the model. This is the prediction. So if you start in one polarity, you know, you're not going to get reversals. There's going to be some little hysteresis. You'll have to wait for a bit. But eventually, you build up possibilities, and then you gradually decay, and it's almost exponential. The mean reversal time is just the integral of t times that, which is about 0.8. So this is with the higher noise. If I wanted to know what's the chance of a reversal lasting 4 million years or longer, it's the area under that curve. If uh, I want to know the likelihood of a Cretaceous supercon, like what, whatever it is, 37, 34, and I need to the probability of that, I would claim, is less than being hit by lightning on your route to pick up your lottery numbers. <laughs> it's really, really small, okay? But what's interesting is you can ask the question, if I change D, if I change D by a certain amount, I can change that mean reversal time quite a lot. A factor of four corresponds to a two times in the uh, RMS fluctuations, and maybe a root two change in the velocity. So you don't need very big changes in the RMS velocity variations in core to produce huge differences in the reversal time rates. So it's, it's these sorts of things that this model, I think, can potentially do. Thanks for the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Okay, uh, so you tweak the noise term. What happens if you tweak the rift term? Absol yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, you're, you're, one thing you know in pattern 2n is that it doesn't get the low values. Yes, absolutely right. And so, right. So that's that's a great point. And so, for example, if I wanted, so if I said this is good, I really think that that is the actual drift term. And I want to make the reversal rates correct. The easiest way to do this is just to change the way that this comes to here. Right. So I can have this basically sort of flat here and then go up. And that would do the job. What that would be kind of saying is that when the field is very low, it, it doesn't really have, it can't kind of get a foothold. You have to get the field up to a certain point before there's, so here the, the, the drift is positive. So this says, when I'm here, make the field larger, right? But if I have it flat here and then have it come up, what it's saying is there's no tendency to grow the field until it gets above a certain threshold and that will start to grow. And that could essentially bring these guys more into line with the observed record. But the point is that we're gonna be able to test these ideas with the numerical dynamo model, see if they reproduce them, right? But I'm talking about like supercomputer, 100,000 core type of solutions, not these Ekman number 10 to the minus two solutions. Okay. So, so, some of the things very that I understand how many field theory, so the figures just based on the data, yeah, I guess there sort of is. I mean, when you think about, uh, so I would put it this way. Uh, you could think about uh, an alpha effect, for example, in a mean field model, and then the, uh, the drift term would include the time average alpha effect, and then you could imagine a random fluctuation on the alpha effect, which would be the noise term. So I think what I would say is that I've taken the mean field thing, split the alpha effect into two parts, a steady part and a fluctuating part. And the fluctuating part is the piece that we're representing as a random function that we're reconstructing from the observations. Okay. Thank you.